Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from just east of Jerusalem. Today is the 11th day of the month of Nisan, 5782. It's the 12th of April, 2022. And uh, we are quickly approaching Pesach, the holiday of Passover. The... Um, the a what's the, the the holiday par excellence the pilgrimage festival par excellence of of Yahadut of Judaism of the Torah really is is Passover everybody's obliged to to uh, bring their korban Pesach their Passover offering up to the holy temple and to enter with it into the inner courtyards where it will be slaughtered and then taken back down to Jerusalem and everyone eats their Korban Pesach, their Passover offering in Jerusalem. It is um, a, a national gathering, a national picnic, a national get-together, everybody in Jerusalem. Uh, that is the idea, that is the ideal. And uh, throughout the course of history, many, many years, it was the reality. In fact, in the final years uh, of the Holy Temple, before it was destroyed, um, when King Agrippus II, the grandson, I believe, of Herod, uh, King Agrippus was a very good king, and he promoted the holiday, the holidays, and he um, asked the the Kohen Gadol to keep count of of all the the um, the kidneys of of all the offerings, the the Passover offerings that were brought. He wanted to know how many Jews were arriving for the holiday, for the pilgrimage, and you can't take a census of Jews, that's forbidden. So he took a census of the kidneys, of course, divided them in half because there were two kidneys to every lamb, and then uh, sort of averaged out how many people uh, it would be, and in Havura, Havura is the, uh, um, the group of people assembled around a single Korban Pesach who will each have a tiny little bit of that Korban Pesach, a tiny little taste of it in order to that is to uh, fulfill the mitzvah of partaking of the Korban Pesach. You didn't need to eat a lot. And that way a number of people, a large number of people could, could uh, all partake of a single um, lamb. And so he came up with a, a quite a large figure um, I forget it was uh, something 600,000 or more I forget but uh, uh, modern studies uh, you know have determined that uh, if that many people uh, if that many if that many Passover offerings were brought something like that then X amount of people millions of people would have to be in Jerusalem which was physically just not large enough really to to hold those people, you'd have to have about 10 people per every square meter of, of surface in Jerusalem. But um, so somewhere along the line, it seems that the, the number was uh, a bit uh, exaggerated. But the point is that large numbers of people would partake, would come to Jerusalem from all over, from all over Israel, from all over the diaspora. And they would be sometimes uh, leaving their homes more than a month before. I mean, we know that uh, in the month of Ada, we're already talking about the beginning of the pilgrimage. Uh, you know, if you live in, anywhere in Jerusalem, in, in Israel, you probably can walk with your family and your offering, where you're taking your offering with you, uh, and maybe more than one offering, maybe a chagiga also, which would be a, a bull. Um, and you're traveling to Jerusalem, so the travel is slow. Uh, it could take you uh, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks even, but if you're coming from the diaspora, from, from Egypt, from uh, way deep in, in Babylon, or even across the, uh, the sea from, from, from uh, uh, Cyprus or from uh, Sicily or from Italy, or from Greece, yes, Jews were all over in the ancient world especially toward the end of the Second Temple era, and they would make that pilgrimage. This is his recorded historical facts. Um, so, yes, Passover is the 
pilgrimage festival par excellence. Yes, there are three pilgrimage festivals. In each pilgrimage festival, uh, males are are required to to be to to attend and to be present, to be to seen and be seen in the holy temple. But uh, only on Passover was everyone required with their korban Pesach, and there are only two positive commandments. What do I mean by a positive command? A commandment and ase, uh, a commandment that we're told to do something, as opposed to a negative commandment, meaning a commandment that we're told to not do something. Right? We were told to honor our mother and father, and we were told not to steal. The first is a positive commandment. The second is a negative commandment. There are only two positive commandments in the entire Torah, 613 commandments, only two positive commandments, which if they are not fulfilled, there is a punishment known as karet. And karet is sort of a mysterious punishment. It's, it's known as it, the, the, the definition, the explanation would be death by the hands of heaven, meaning you're not going to be put to death by a, by a firing squad or you know, by order of, of a, a human court. No, God will handle it in his way. And your death will be an untimely death. That's the karet, uh, before it's time, uh, or a uh, you know a tragic, uh, horrible death of some sort. It's it's something to <laughs> you really want to avoid. And it is a number of, of commandments. Who, uh, if you do something that you're not supposed to do, you will receive that punishment. But there are only two positive commandments that if you don't do them, you'll receive that punishment. And one is Brit Milah, circumcision, which is the entering of the covenant of Avraham with Hashem uh, for every male infant. And the other is Korban Pesach, which really is the, it's the Brit Milah of the entire nation. It's when the entire nation of Israel, while in Egypt, uh, made this covenant uh, we made an agreement with Hashem. We will slaughter the, the the Passover lamb, and Hashem will take us out of Egypt. You know all the ten plagues that led up to to this. They're all for the purpose of, uh, you know, dressing down Egypt, dressing down Pharaoh, shaking them up, showing that God is one. There are no other gods in the world that are equal to God, the one God. All the other false gods don't stand a chance. Uh, and this was a lesson for Egypt and for the for all the nations, and also an important lesson for Israel to look upon and see that their God, the God of Israel, uh, is the mightiest, uh, the only God. But all that being said and done, for Israel to leave Egypt, to extricate itself from Egypt. Uh, to be taken out of Egypt according to God's promise, Israel had to fulfill its part. And its part was the Korban Pesach. And we learn all about that in the book of Exodus chapter 12, uh, where we're told uh, this is the first of your months. And then it goes right on into all the instructions for uh, the uh, taking a lamb on the 10th day and slaughtering that lamb on the 14th and the eve of Passover. And on that night... Uh, uh, having the Seder Passover, the Passover meal, and then leaving Egypt forever. And your ticket out was the Korban Pesach. Uh, and why was it such a crucial covenant? Uh, because for Israel to slaughter these lambs in the midst of their Egyptian neighbors, Egyptian uh, uh, nation, to which Israel was enslaved, took a tremendous amount of faith, emunah, courage, trust in Hashem, and certainty of their path. Uh, the lamb was a sacred animal. Uh, it was a deity in Egypt. And to slaughter this lamb was a slap in the face uh, to all Egyptians. And to take the lamb, as Israel was instructed, on the 10th day uh, of, of Nisan, only to be slaughtered on the 14th meant for four, four days you're holding on to this lamb. And they were instructed, we're told, to tie the lamb to their bedposts. So they, they couldn't ignore this lamb. 
But not only could Israel not ignore this land, but the Egyptians had four days to say, what, we're going to let them get away with this? You know, like what stopped Egypt from, from rising up and slaughtering all the Jews before the Jews could slaughter the lambs? Well, Hashem stopped them. But what, what inspired Hashem, let's say, to, to stop the Egyptians? The courage and the faith that Israel exhibited by following Hashem's commandments. Everything is, is a partnership in Judaism. And the partnership begins for the nation right here right here at this moment. So that's why the Korban Pesach is such an important uh, commandment. I mean, all commandments are important, and we're told that there's no greater commandment or lesser commandment. But by the same token, there's nothing like Korban Pesach. It is the, it is the, the birth certificate of the nation of Israel. Um, and once Israel slaughtered that lamb, there was no going back. Once you have slaughtered the sacred cows of, the, of your host nation, once you have, 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 have rid yourselves of, of their idolatries and their beliefs and their certainties, because you have your own and you have your own God and your own certainties, once you've done that, there's no going back. So this was the birth of the nation of Israel. The beginning of the march toward freedom is a uh, Pesach. Is Passover is known as as a Chag Chirut, the festival of freedom. And freedom's uh, you know everybody loves freedom. Everybody loves to talk about freedom. Everybody says, "Wow, nothing like freedom. It's so good to be free, right? Free at last. Free at last. These are important words. Free at last." But what is freedom? I think that so many people today misunderstand freedom. I think societies misunderstand freedom. I think that to many people today, unfortunately, freedom means to be, be free from, to be free from obligations, to not have to do anything for anyone else's behalf but your own, to be free to be yourself, to be free to do your thing, Freedom for many people is very in, egocentric. It's all about me, what I want. You're not going to stop me. I want to do this. You're not going to stop me. I don't want to do that. You're not going to stop me. You're not going to make me. Individual freedoms are very important, yes. But freedom has a flip side and a more important side, and that is obligation. We purchase our freedom, we earn our freedom, we work for our freedom, we're obligated to do things in order to gain that freedom and in order to maintain that freedom. Uh, what's the saying? Uh, the price of liberty, uh, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. I think that was Thomas Jefferson. Um, price of liberty is yes you have to constantly be working for it constantly be earning it and and the i say that leaving egypt on passover eve on the 15th of pa of nisan was the beginning of the journey toward freedom because israel had done part one they had cut themselves off from all those things that were holding them back all those things that were tying them down all those burdens that they had been laid upon them from other cultures that weren't their own, that weren't coming from Hashem. But now they're on the way to gaining their freedom, and their freedom ultimately will be, will be hammered out at Mount Sinai when they receive the Torah, when they receive the rule book. H how does this freedom work? How do we achieve it? How do we maintain it? How do we make the most of it? And that's the Torah. The word for freedom is more than one word for freedom uh, in Hebrew, but the word that we say uh, about Passover is Chag Chirut. Chirut is freedom. And, and Chirut also, if you say it a little bit different, it's Chirut. And, and Chirut uh, means to inscribe something. Something is etched in stone. And we're told that the, the words on the, on the Luchot Abrit, the, the Ten Commandments, and the two tablets of the law were, were inscribed, right? Hashem, finger, inscribed on the first set. They were etched in, etched in stone, right? When something's etched in stone, it's permanent. 
And so the word charut means etched, etched in stone. Cherut means freedom. So uh, with a little bit of imagination, we can see that we gain our freedom by, by, by engraving our beliefs, our principles, our rights and wrongs in stone. That's how we gain our freedom, by being, by being uh, grounded in a set of, 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 of rights and wrongs, in a set of, of morality, in a code that applies to an entire nation, that's how uh, a nation gains freedom. The United States has a constitution. Via that constitution, the United States, the people of the United States can embrace and, and, and actualize freedom. But look at that constitution. There's, there's do's and there's don'ts, not only for the government, also for the citizens. Also for the citizens. It's a precious gift, freedom. It's so precious that in Judaism, we mark it every year. We mark the beginning of our journey toward freedom every year. And we are told to remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim, leaving Egypt every year. We, we never forget that we weren't always free, that our forefathers were slaves, and that we had to fight for and earn the freedom. And yes, we were also blessed by Hashem who performed miracles on our behalf, but those miracles were, were not for free. Those miracles were because we earned those miracles. When Israel showed the courage to, to go out and, and, and purchase a lamb in the marketplace in Egypt, and the Egyptians said, why are you buying a lamb? How come you're all buying a lamb today? And Israel said, because we're going to slaughter it. Because our, our God said to slaughter it on the 14th. Uh, that took courage. They couldn't hide the fact that they were going to slaughter. They, they couldn't make up a story that, you know, we're going to buy this lamb because uh, we've adopted a new, a, a new pet. You, you couldn't. You had to come up with it. You had to tell the truth. And you know what they say, the truth will set you free. And in this case, yes, uh, that was Israel's key to freedom by, by fulfilling this this commandment, this really the second commandment in Egypt. The first commandment was to mark out the months. And marking out the months was really a prerequisite for the Passover offering because A, until Israel determines, has, has control, has oversight over its own time, its own calendar, then uh, saying that you're going to Offer the, the the Passover offering and the fourteenth really has no meaning. You have to have a calendar first. You have to have control of your time. You have to have you have to have uh, uh, control over your own actions, and actions are a product of, of time. So yes, the first thing was a calendar, and the second thing was the action, and that was the Passover offering. Now, to this very day. Israel, as a nation, as individuals, we are obliged to bring a Passover offering. And I told you that the, that the, the punishment for not is karit. And there's only one other positive commandment that has a similar punishment, and that is brit milah. And, you know, Jews, every Jew, religious, not religious, in between this, that, circumcises their, 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 male, ch their male children. There, there's, except for some fringe elements, there's not a question here. It's, you know, of all the commandments, this one is, is, is it, because this one is marked in your flesh, and this one is a sign forever who you are. It's your identity as an individual. And it is honored and, and kept for all these many, many thousands of years by the entire nation of Israel. And a very parallel commandment is the Korban Pesach. And of course, after the destruction of the Holy Temple, the ability to bring the Korban Pesach to the Temple no longer existed. And so uh, the commandment ceased to be uh, realizable. And so it ceased. And of course, we have many other you know, aspects and, 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 
and customs uh, that have to do with Passover that, you know, we keep Passover. Passover is, is uh, you know, one of the most universally kept holidays in, in, in Israel and in, in Judaism. Um, again, more observant, less observant. Passover is a special holiday for the entire nation. Um, and there's so many ways to observe it. And of course, the big commandment today is, is that we only eat matzah. We don't have any leavened uh, uh, bread or leavened anything uh, over the seven days. But the key commandment was always the Korban Pesach. And over the past 150 or so years, as the Jews began to... Uh, began to ascend back into Israel and the Jewish community began to grow and become significant in Israel. Uh, rabbis already in the 19th century were saying, we need to bring the Korban Pesach. It's time to bring the Passover offering. And uh, there were great rabbis in the 19th century who tried to uh, make some kind of arrangement, some kind of deal with the Ottoman uh, uh, empire, the Ottoman uh, rulers who ruled the uh, the Holy Land at the time. And, of course, today, it is Israel that rules the land. It's Israel who has sovereignty over the Temple Mount. And the aspect of the Korban Pesach, which, is, which, re, which requires the Temple Mount, is the aspect that the, the blood of, of each lamb needs to be dashed against the altar on the Temple Mount. In temple times, people would go up uh, in, in three different shifts uh, into the inner courtyard. The people would bring their own offerings. I mean, I, I imagine an entire family wouldn't go up together, but uh, one or two people in order to perform the, 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 the slaughter. Uh, and they'd do that in the inner courtyard. And anybody who knew how could slaughter the lamb. It didn't require a kohen, but a kohen had to gather up the blood in the, in the uh, bazik, in the vessel, gold or silver vessel, which, which they would, the, at the slaughter, they would, they would channel the blood into that vessel. And then there was like a bucket brigade. They would carry a hand from one kohen to the next, all the way to the, to the altar. And the last kohen at the end would, would dash the blood against the altar. The blood against the altar was a requirement of the Korban Pesach. That's what's required today. That's why for 2,000 years there's been no Korban Pesach, but there's been no altar. So there are many rabbis today who are clamoring for, we need to be able to do the Korban Pesach. I don't know of any rabbi, serious rabbi, who says we don't need to do the Korban Pesach. Uh, you know, there may be rabbis who feel uh, they have other things they want to concern themselves with. Uh, there are certainly uh, rabbis who will say, listen, you know, it's n nothing to talk about because we can't do it because of geopolitical reasons. It's not going to happen anytime in the near future, so don't bother me with this. But you will not find a rabbi who will rule against saying, no, no, it is not required. It's no longer a requirement. That doesn't exist. It is a requirement. And many rabbis... Uh, have already come out and stated that, yes, it is an imperative that we can bring the Korban Pesach. Uh, there are many rabbis who are very active in trying to change the reality. Uh, of course, the Temple Institute is very active in trying to change reality, and one of the ways we try to change it is to, is to each year do a demonstration of, of the uh, Passover offering. And there was one done today. Uh, hopefully be able to get hold of some photographs to share. Um, and that is to A, instruct people how it's done, instruct Kohanim how it's done, and to uh, get interest. And uh, tr there's tremendous interest. There's tremendous public interest in this. And the green light that we're all waiting for is the green light from the Israeli government. So you say, wait, 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 take it back a few steps. What The Israel government's going to say, you can do a Korban Pesach. What the Israel's government going to say, go build a, build a temple today and, and do the Korban Pesach? I, I wish that the Israel government would say, build a temple today and do the Korban Pesach. No, but 
to do the Korban Pesach, in fact, to do any offering, what's required is the altar. Offerings can be made before the temple is rebuilt. And in fact, that's what, exactly what happened uh, during the rebuilding of the second temple. If you read from the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, that they were already making offerings on a rebuilt altar before the temple itself was rebuilt. Um, now, the requirement for the altar, it's dimensions, of course, and and the type of stone, and, and that stone's not going to be cut with metal, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, plus its exact precise location on the Temple Mount. It needs to be where it stood in the first and second temples. Now, we know where that is. We know that location. There's nothing on that location in the Temple Mount right now. It's an empty area. So, And we also know, because uh, we have uh, done this and conducted tests and made models, the Temple Institute has, we can c construct a temporary uh, altar. It wouldn't be the full-size altar that stood in the second temple, which, by the way, was much larger than the altar that stood in the first temple. It wouldn't be that full size, but it would be the required size. And, of course, the required dimensions and the required materials. The altar could be set up, uh, the animals could be slaughtered, and the altar could be taken down all in an afternoon. Which means that uh, if all the interested parties all the relevant parties would agree, uh, it could be done. Quite simply, it could be done. And we would, once again, after 2,000 years, be fulfilling uh, this incredible commandment of the Passover offering. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that the effect of that would reverberate just as it reverberated that very first time. Uh, in Egypt, in that the the message, the clarity of that message that would go out from the Korban Pesach being offered again in Jerusalem, that Israel has, has arrived, that we are free, that we are in control of our own destiny, in control of our own calendar, in control of, 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 of our relationship with Hashem, that we're free in our land. That message would be heard loud and clear. Now, of course, uh, who are the relevant parties? Uh, the government of Israel. Obviously, the uh, Muslims who uh, claim, uh, claim uh, ownership over the Temple Mount uh, and any other nations who decide to get in on the act. Um, so yes, the message would have to be loud and clear, and the determination would have to be just like the determination in Egypt. You know, when we did it in Egypt, Egypt was the strongest nation in the world at the time, the superpower. To do it there, if you could do it there, you could, you know, you could do it anywhere. If, like, if you could make it in New York, you could make it anywhere. If you could s slaughter the do the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering in Egypt, you could really do it anywhere. And um, I do believe that if Israel had a leadership that was determined, determined and focused, and, and, and determined to do it for the sake of the commandment, for the sake of, of, of fulfilling this covenantal commandment between us and Hashem, and, is, and if Israel were to present that to the nations, present it to the Muslims, present it to the, to the Christian nations, present it to the world. I think, I do believe that Israel could, could uh, get the, uh, uh, the backing of all those parties and uh, that uh, it could be done very readily, very quickly, and when we move on from there. And I think it would be a great... Um, a great clarification of, of Israel's relationship with the nations, with its own land, with its own sovereignty, with the Torah, with Hashem, um, all for the good. All for the good. I don't think it would bring bloodshed or strife. I think it would bring peace and understanding. You know, uh, Israel left Egypt 
They slaughtered their lambs. They left Egypt. And uh, a few months later, uh, Yitro comes along. And he was the you know heathen prophet number one in the world. And he says, well, I see what Hashem has done for you. I'm so happy. I see that there's only one God. And I've now, you know, I've, I've thrown away all of my idolatries. And, and I see that Hashem is really great. So, yes, I think that when Israel has the gumption to, to do what's required of it, that the response that we get uh, from the nations is a very positive response. Uh, so, in terms of, you know, the Korban Pesach and, wow, you know, it's crazy talk. Uh, I don't think it's crazy talk. I, I really don't. I think that it's a matter of uh, acting responsibly uh, as Jews and, you know, really taking up the the fact that we have returned to the land of Israel, taking it seriously. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not make-believe and it's not a dream. We're, we're wide awake and um, we have this obligation and like any obligation, you know, it's best to fulfill it rather than to let it uh, sit and fester. So, those are my thoughts about the Passover offering. I'm just checking now to see how much time we have left in our show. And uh, I see that we have, I think, a good few minutes left. We have, oh, we have about three minutes, not so much time. So anyway, Passover, it begins this Shabbat, this Friday evening. Uh, having Passover and Shabbat always makes things a little more complicated, a little more involved, but it's going to be okay. Seven-day festival of Passover begins on Shabbat, will end next Friday, and of course, right immediately at the conclusion of Passover, uh, we go right into Shabbat. Um, so it's sort of like eight days of, uh, of holiday, but it's really seven days plus Shabbat and this, this coming Motzei Shabbat and Motzei Shabbat means the out, the, the outgoing of Shabbat, I guess the leaving of Shabbat, which is another Hebrew expression for Saturday night. This coming Saturday night, of course, is the 16th of, 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 of Nisan. And that is the beginning of, of the, of the, that's the time of the Omer offering, the, the barley offering which was performed in the Holy Temple. Uh, and we'll have more about that uh, uh, as, as the week, next week progresses. Uh, and it's the beginning of the Sfirat to Omer, the counting of the Omer in our day. Uh, of course, we count 49 days from that day, beginning the day after the first day of Passover, the day after the, the Seder evening. And we begin counting 49 days. And of course, on the day after 49 days, the 50th day, is the holiday of Shavuot. Shavuot means weeks, and 49 days is seven full weeks. We count seven full weeks, and then Shavuot, which of course is the festival that marks also the, the uh, inauguration of the, of the uh, wheat harvest, and of course it's the anniversary of the receiving of Torah Mount Sinai, which as I mentioned earlier, is the, the part two of Israel's journey to freedom. Part one is the Korban Pesach, uh, leaving Egypt. Part two is Mount Sinai. And part three, of course, is entering the land. Here's the music. Uh, I'm wishing everybody, absolutely everybody, a Chag Pesach Kasher Vasameach, a very happy festival of freedom, very happy, happy, Passover holiday. I'll be on again next week during the Passover. We'll have another Temple Talk. Again, Chag Sameach to everybody. Temple Talk.